And yes, I am so happy to have Amali Shrez with us today. So Amali is the founder and MD of White Noise Communications, and she has experience that covers the financial and professional services sector, including research, business development, um, and multidisciplinary design practices, uh, and was most recently a keen component within the executive team of ASX Gold Developer Papillion Resources. So Emily brings an industry knowledge and understanding to the communication process and strategy with a focus on developing a proactive ongoing client relationship. And with her expertise, it is going to be awesome to learn how to rock our investor story. So it's going to be a great session. Please keep using the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much for joining. It's amazing to have you. Thank you so much, Jess, for having me on. So today, um, we're taking a little bit of a different approach, as um, Jess has talked about. My background um, is in investor relations, and I've had 15 years working from um, the sell side and in a research team, and then in house um, running an investor relations company for um, a company called Papillon Resources that was acquired in 2013. Um, so today we're running through um, a little bit about white noise. So, yeah, again, we're a respected um, investor relations consultancy group based in Western Australia, servicing companies across Australia. We're a team of 16 um, and we're really focused and passionate about what we do. So we were founded in 2016. We've been around for seven years now. Um, and our purpose is your story. So we're supporting ASX listed companies. Um, our team adopts a strategic thinking with tangible outcomes for our clients and wanting to build and grow, grow and drive those companies. So personally, myself, alongside my team, we've had the privilege of being involved in multiple investor stories. At the moment, we are working with about 35 listed companies and they vary in size. Um, you know, it, it, I'm very passionate about this and how we build those stories. We've had a number of them um, where we've, they've come on as very small micro cap companies and they've grown up um, to become majors. So it's really a privilege for us as a company to be part of that um, very early phase with them and take them on that story. And not just myself, but the whole team are very involved in that. Um, we break down what we do across strategy, content, design, and that investor relations. So it's an end-to-end -end solution in terms of how we work with them. Um, so yeah, just this is a bit of our story and our wonderful team um, and our purpose is your story, which is what I was touching on there. So investor relations, say what? So investor relations is the responsibility of a company, usually a public, public company, to provide investors with accurate and accountable information for their company affairs. What we talk about a lot at White Noise, though, is it's just beyond the traditional IR. So strategic communications are really important for companies. Um, so that's actually embedding a narrative and a whole view about what the company is, not just um, that output. So it, it goes deeper. So that can be a company's branding that is um, the positioning of the narrative throughout the staff and really clearly identifying, understanding their objectives. So IR is normally an output and a service, but to, for us at White Noise, we believe it's more strategic communication focus that companies should take with their investor story in particular, because it should really be core to what a company does on a day-to-day -day basis. We're focusing today really on ASS. ASX listed companies and with obviously being on GeoHug, the focus around resource companies. So the ASX market um, and the landscape, there's about 2,100 listed companies and approximately 70% of them are resource companies. So this is a really crowded space covering, and all the geos on here are going to get kind of annoyed, a very frustrated at me, but like a really technical subject for people to understand. So what we spend a lot of time is building the bridge to that connection. So what is technical and really important for companies to understand, but also how we can simplify that for the investor market to understand. And the reason for that being so important is when we kind of, when we talk about the ASX market and the why. So the investor landscape is forever changing and a recent report from the ASX that was updated just a couple of months ago in 2023, the market um, investors is really, the audience side is absolutely dominated by retail investors and in particular retail investors that use online broking um, for these trades and orders these days. So um, there's about 10 million Australians hold investments and as I said, 70% of them are actively trading online. So they're not seeking professional advice from um, advisors or technical background I guess, professionals that understand what's going on, but they're making these decisions themselves and they're using a number of ways and platforms to actually do this and inform themselves. So again, it leads back to, in particular, when you're in that 70% in the smaller market cap side, 
why an investor story um, when you, you know, in one of your phases of your mining life cycle is really important to unpack and explain in simplified terms for this market to understand it. And then we're going to talk a little bit further about what that looks like and when these different types of investors come into play. So obviously just touching on here very high level, there are obviously private and institutional investors that we're going to talk about a little bit as we step through this. So um, this is a great chart and, and I am going back to a little bit of basics here for some people and really with a heavy lean into um, the resources sector but a little bit of a mineral discovery investor life cycle and talking about the journey of a company when it goes through discovery um, that speculation or sorry early exploration to the discovery and then through that um, feasibility development stage into production so this is actually core when we're talking to our clients, um, the companies and understanding investors and what kind of um, group we're actually looking to pitch to at this point. And something that as a team, we like to refer back to um, just to really simplify it and remind ourselves at times when people are on different journeys and where they might sit in this. And it's a really great tool that we use actually when we have new people come into the industry um, that join White Noise and explaining to them how our communication strategy change across um, the investor group that we're looking to or the investor type that we're looking to pitch to. So many people have most probably seen this before, but I do like to get, as I've said, just refer back to it because it really helps frame um, and even remind at times that executive teams, so we're, at White Noise, we're generally dealing with executive teams when we're in that smaller that market cap, what their objectives are and why they're sitting there. So just to kind of unpack it a little bit, um, and I'm not actually sure if you can see my pointer, but in this early kind of four to five stage, this is like the concept and pre-discovery. So whilst this is at times one of the most technical aspects of um, a company when they're unpacking their story, it's actually also the most critical part to be able to simplify that because you're heavily being backed by retail investors. So at times this can actually still be, you know, maybe your high net or your more um, sophisticated uh, investors coming in at this phase. But retail are really the people that are investing um, in the story and taking, I guess, let's call it that speculative punt. They're generally what we see are backing um, boards and management and most probably a little bit of neurology. So it's really interesting um, these phases here because, again, like I've touched on, it can also be one of the most technical aspects, uh, technical times for a company because you're actually really trying to do that early exploration and understand and identify your targets and what you're looking for. Um, as we move through, we start to move through into that speculation. So this could be a company that's got some, you know, really interesting hits that have started to come in and we're starting to see that formation of a resource and maybe the early, you know, base estimations of those resources and what they look like. And then we see that start to transform into this retail high net um, environment. So again, we're still making sure that we need to really unpack um, that, I guess, let's call it that speculation and explain those um, this, uh, those results that might be coming in, those exploration results in a manner that um, is consistent and shows that story um, of, you know, developing out, if it is to become a resource, what that exploration program looks like and what um, the company in particular is spending the money on. What we quite often see in this phase for junior resource companies is they might have access to a number or a very large tenement package and their story becomes really confused because they're cross commodity, they've um, got a large land holding and so they're actually trying to drill and explore because they're really trying to find that one hit. We, we know with um, resource companies in particular um, and, and, the, and geology at times, it's really hard to to know where that is and you're, you're currently constantly interpreting and working out what your exploration program looks like. And one drill hole can actually change the whole destiny of a company. I mean, there's a really great story around, um, you know, I encourage people to have a look back at the, the Chellis, um, the Chellis story, or Chellis um, used to be Chellis Gold, but obviously not Chellis Gold anymore. That exploration program um, that found their, their asset that they're known for was actually based on the last drill program where um, it was a bit of speculation and, and someone had given them some advice that maybe you should pop a couple of holes over here and it's turned into, a, I can't even think of what the market cap size is now, but it's in excess of a couple of billion dollar market cap size. So in that speculation um, period, it is actually, you know, we're, we're getting these high nets come in, uh, high net investors, but still mainly a resource, a retail base. So we need to be clear about what our communication is. And then once we have that discovery, we start to transition into an insto strategic, maybe that might be a cornerstone um, kind of investor base. And these types of investors are traditionally more educated. So again, we're most probably leaning back into making our announcements and releases and information available a bit more technical. 
Um, but also remembering along the way, we've still got our retail investors here. So we have to be conscious um, of what our investor base looks like. And the way that we handle all of this um, at White Noise is we're constantly looking at our registry and, and having an understanding what that, prog that, that progression looks like. So what is our top 20 looking like? Um, are they institutional funds or strategic um, holders there holding different components? And so we're making sure that we're, you know, doing that constant recheck to ensure that our investors are actually getting um, the right messaging as we're putting out releases. And if that investor base is not the right investor base, how are we adapting our communications to make sure that we actually are able to target our messaging to the right investor base? Um, and then this flows through in the cycle, it, it, it goes up and down. So we go through that risky period, they call it the orphan period where, um, you know, it, it's the make or break period for a company, particularly if you're a single asset company, um, where you're going through feasibility into development, you, you know, you can have the risks of commodity changes there and and funding and a lot of things, um, you know, lots of people that are on this call today most probably have seen many projects that have hit the orphan period where they've had a great resource and commodity pricing has changed and so they've had to abandon that. Um, but what we ideally want to see is um, into that, uh, that development and startup phase. The other thing that's really interesting about this cycle is also we're talking about investors here, but there's also these opportunities for M&A to happen. So I was um, privileged to be part of the Papillon Resources team and um, and that was a really, so they had the Fakola asset in, in Mali. Um, that was a really interesting project um, for me to be involved in. We actually went down the path of an M&A um, and were acquired, as I mentioned, by um, B2 Gold in, I think it was 2013, 2014. The reason why that was so interesting is, is a lot of people come back to us and say, um, as a company, we should have taken that project to development. Again, I wasn't at the lead of, of making those decisions, but when you sit back and have a look at um, this, the, the mining, you know, investor life or the mining mineral discovery life cycle, there is a lot of risk when you get into that development phase. And um, the board, you know, looked at it in terms of the return for having B2 come on board um, to, to develop that asset. And they already were a multi-project company producing, um, I think they were in like the top, three to five um, largest gold producers in the world at the time and, and ha were producing projects near, nearby. So they actually understood well the jurisdiction risk and they actually had a track record of delivering projects um, to market, into production, and they also had the funding internally to be able to back that. So B2, once they acquired the, the Papillon for Kohler asset, were able to bring the project um, online much faster than what we had anticipated and actually in, at a much lower capex than what we had also anticipated at the time. So for shareholders, it was a really great result. Um, and they also, shareholders when they were part of that M&A were actually also able to have the upside of um, exposure to multi-assets. So that risk was really reduced um, for existing shareholders. That for Kohler asset has now gone on to be, I think it's in the top eight of one of the largest gold assets um, in the world and, and is really interesting to have a look at. So if people are interested, I think you should, should take a look at for Kohler. Um, so what does this mean in terms of a strategy for an investor story? So we talk about taking control of your investor narrative um, requires a strategy. You need to sit that back. And we always like to ask our companies um, for managing directors and, and, and the ex if they can get involved, um, a clear understanding of three things. And these are our three points. And these are our reference points constantly throughout um, the strategy that we're involving for our companies. So it's your objective, your audience, and your competitive landscape. Um, at White Noise, we strongly believe really rechecking back on these three points to understand that we are actually targeting our messaging the right way and that this is helping our companies be able to fulfill their investment goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit further about what these look like. So uh, the, the strategy objectives, um, which is what I've just touched on a little bit briefly, is are you going to be, sorry, this one that's missing off here, but are you going to just stay as an explorer um, and look to find that asset yourself? So exploration, um, that leads back to asking questions internally from your strategy and your objectives. Do you have, um, you know, the financial capacity to continue to be the explorer um, looking for the asset? Do you actually have the right land holding? Do you have the team that can support that um, in your objectives? So that's really clear to understand. And also, um, and then on the other side is any M&A opportunities. So that could be both yourself, again, as your objective going, do we have the right land parcel to have, you know, that 1 million 10, 10, mine, 10 year mine life cycle to be considered a great gold project, for example, 
Um, or do we need to actually look out and go that we need to acquire some land nearby and there could be some strategic partnerships that could be attractive in that? And the other, the other way to always look at it as well is a little bit like the Papillon story, your neighbours and, and, um, and people around you that actually logistically make sense to actually um, be part of an M&A transaction. And, you know, always in the back of your mind, those M&A transactions need to be beneficial um, if you're being acquired. So it, it's making sure that you position yourself. And when you're going through this phase um, that we talked about in the life cycle, is constantly looking at how you can be de-risking your projects. So I guess the great discipline that I learned working at Papillon was be, always being focused on um, focusing on that you, if you are in this early exploration as a junior, focusing on your um, your own journey, which is to build that project and um, have that exploration, so finding your resource, but also at the same time, how you might actually position yourself um, for an M&A opportunity. So um, as I touched on, obviously, Papillon um, was a great story there. And then just at the end of last year, Oclo Resources was also acquired by B2. So a similar kind of scenario where um, the board worked through, one, we were looking to increase that resource size, but also how you could position the relationship to show that uh, de-risk the project and show to, um, you know, larger peers that might be within the region that um, it was a great opportunity to um, for them to actually be able to acquire an asset um, at a, a competitive price that could actually add value to their balance sheet. Um, also, so defining those long-term objectives or whether you might be a developer or producer. So, Sitting out, so starting off is, you know, there's a phase when you're, you've got your um, resource defined. Um, we talked to clients about actually starting to position themselves as a developer or a producer. So we talk about positioning your communications plan at that point when you've got your resource and you want to move into that, that phase. Really think about who you actually aspire to be like as a company. So what are the aspirational peers that you have? And so that even leads into um, branding for a company. Branding is really important. A great example where we've done that recently was um, Lion Town Resources. So White Noise led the rebrand of Lion Town um, about 12 months ago when they, I think they were about an $800, $900 million company when we started working with them. And then they, um, and they've moved obviously into development. So there is a big transition between a, a junior explorer that has a resource into being a developer and producer. And that also repositions the company in um, this, this life cycle that we're talking about because it also changes the perception for the audience um, and how they perceive you. So um, again, just as, I won't spend too much time on this because we have touched a little bit as I've gone, been going through, but um, again, reflecting constantly through this cycle that you're going through of growth about um, what your audience is, what your audience is, and understanding who they are. Again, it's really important to make sure that your communications are actually at the level that people understand, and then also be mindful that um, there is those strategic, you know, that whether it's a JV or an M&A, like I've touched on with your objectives, it's really important to understand if that is the, the um, board or the company's objective to make sure that that can be incorporated into um, your narrative as you're building it out. Um, and then strategy landscape, so. This is the other one, the other point that we always remind our clients to have look have a look back at. I touched on earlier about what um, the ASX is made up of and talking about how we've got that large retail investor base at the moment. That's actually um, the thing that I didn't cover back then as well is that was a product of COVID. So during COVID, the ASX released a report back in 2020 that they had a 30 to 40% increase in retail investors entering the market. Um, and again, using online trading platforms. Um, as a result of the fact that they weren't able to travel anymore. So they had all these excess funds um, uh, sitting around that they weren't able to use on, you know, their travel overseas or luxury items and they were bed, bed down and had more time. So they actually spent time in investing in the market. But again, what we've actually developed is um, a group of people that are not able to, and I've just lost my headphones now, Jess, I'm doing well today, um, that are not able, can you still hear me? Yeah, that are not, they're not educated and they're actually, um, actually yeah looking for information themselves on the internet but what we also find interesting about them is they're actually the commodity agnostic so they're actually um they're actually not focused besides being uh, by market trends so maybe when the, the media is publishing like at the moment a lot about the battery metals they're really jumping on board with those um they're also agnostic about lo locations so they don't really know an, a huge amount about um the regional risks of projects at times and so sometimes they're either uh scared off by them or um 
they're more attracted to maybe, you know, WA was having a conversation recently with some American investors and everything in America is clearly better. So they will only invest in America, even if the, the financials of another project add up. Um, and also market cap. So you quite often hear people not actually understanding what the market cap means of the company and they're seeing a company that's maybe a one or two cent share, um, but has a huge amount of um, shares on issue. And so they actually don't understand. They, they think that they're investing in a one or two cent share, but um, the reality is it's, it's a large market cap with just a lot of um, shares on issue. So understanding your competitive landscape, sometimes what we look back when you peel the layers back, uh, especially if you've got a retail focused audience, is that your, your peers or your competitors in that landscape are not just as straightforward as what you expect, especially at the moment in the market when we're seeing people really, um, the, the market's getting a little bit tougher. This is actually going to become more and more obvious for people because it's not going to be a straight gold by gold play or a lithium by lithium play. You're going to see people that understand something more or it's positioned in its narrative better for people to understand and them actually leaning into investing in one of those stories more than what, you know, maybe fundamentally is a better story. So the narrative starts to become really important when we're in a market like this. Um, the implication the how. So um, obviously we're talking about ASX listed companies and in the listed environment announcements are obviously compliance based. So what we look at for our companies is like sporadic announcements are just not enough. So we talked about that 2100 listed companies early on and that's a lot of companies and on any given day there can be you know a couple of hundred announcements plus that hit the asx and how do you stand out so what we use is a, a, a mixture of traditional media and um, digital strategy to help build company narratives and be present so our team is really focused and internally i'm really proud of our digital team that we have that's head up but headed up by shelly shelby and bella they are just focused on building a presence for a company. And, and many people know this, that digital is the quickest way that we can receive information um, on our companies and actually stay relevant. So having a, a, um, a strategy around um, that is just beyond announcements for listed companies today is unbelievably important. It's also a way that we can actually repurpose and recap information. So it's a great way to reach retail and audiences, but the institutional audiences are actually there as well using this because they can receive a tweet and an update about a company in their phone in their hand instantly on a regular basis so using traditional media and a digital um, platforms just really helps us with that amplification across the board um so in play the starting points that i always like to remind people back and i'm trying to keep this really simple is tailor your points to your audience so using that mining my mind life cycle of understanding where your company sits what is your investor base or what do you want your investor base to be so keeping that in mind all the time and rechecking back is really critical. Simplify your presentation. Less words allow you to speak to your presentation. So quite often if you have a, re a presentation that goes to a retail, pers uh, retail audience or even just the presentation that's released to the ASX, we encourage our clients to really pair that back and just have key points in there. When you're overcrowded with lots of words, it becomes really complicated for people to understand what your investment narrative is or what your key investment points are. You can actually, simplifying that back also allows you when you're doing one-on-one -on -one meetings to actually really target what your investor story is to the audience that you're speaking to. So you can understand by feedback what someone's looking for and really um, lean into to the right answers there. Um, I'm going to just jump through a little bit of a, um, a, a real life example. Um, Oclo is actually no longer listed as a company anymore. It was acquired at the end of last year by B2 Gold. But this was one of their last presentations um, that we put together. So there's a couple of parts that frame a presentation um, and if we're just going to really high level simplify how this looks in play. And then the reason why I'm using investor presentation for a junior company, a junior explorer, their investor presentation is one of the most critical tools that they can have. And having their investment narrative right in this point actually then leads through to the basis of the rest of their comms strategy, whether that's their website or how we engage on social media. Um, so there's a couple of things that I always like to just simplify for clients when we're doing an investor presentation to think about what they might do here. So starting with this slide here, which is slide three of their presentation, which is actually their investment highlights. So the investment highlights, it's very early on in the presentation and it helps frame the story that's about to be told to the audience. So what we want to see here is some of the great highlights that exist for the company that they've achieved to date and explaining a little bit of an understanding about what you're about to um, lead into with your presentation. So here with Oclo, we've got um, four easy to, a key headline, a hero statement, which is what they're known for. And then four easy points for people to just, um, to rationalize as you're talking. 
I like to say that this presentation sets the scene for what's about to come and hopefully it engages people to want to actually sit and listen to the rest of the presentation. In the Oakley presentation, um, and I'm not diving in deep to actually the exploration story and how this sat with their resource and what they had, but more about how we took a communication approach to this. So they actually had a resource that they put out, um, I think it was about a year prior to this presentation. And it was, um, whilst the resource was high grade, it, it didn't hit a magic number of 1 million ounces that people expect to see. So quite often as well, we have these expectations in the market that people have these nice round numbers um, that they like, they want to see um, companies achieve in particular with resource estimates that come out, um, but not, and again, this comes back to education, but not actually understanding the basis um, of what that, um, of, of the quality, I should say, of the resource or how that's been interpreted. So this was actually a really high grade resource, even though it didn't hit a million ounces and it was all contained within um, very shallow pits above surface. So it was actually very attractive in terms of what it looked like. Um, but, but again, wasn't 1 million ounces at the time, but what, and also, but it still had huge amounts of potential. So what we actually started to unpack here was the stories about how these, um, this resource existed across multiple, um, multiple zones, but were able to be uh, all, all critical in terms of growing um, the system. And there was actually another uh, project that's nearby, which name has escaped me for a second, but we've had a very similar kind of outlook. So what this image here is showing, um, and the reason why we use this picture was actually showing the audience that all of these, um, I guess, systems were very were, were located in what we called like a satellite or close proximity. So they were able to be shipped uh, truck, sorry, to a central plant. And so this project was still going to have the potential to be really economical, even though um, on the plan it was is mapped out. So this was all taken in one picture. So utilizing this this diagram to really set the scene throughout the presentation for people to understand actually what we were talking about. The other part was um, this is in essence this looking at the same view, but this is from a plan view. So from the plan view, what we were actually using was again unpacking the resource, and this is, can be quite complicated. Or you know, I'm going to to, to use it in a very simple basis. Each zone um, offered a different potential of upside, and there was because there was multiple areas that we were actively exploring to increase this resource. We needed to explain to the audience um, what the drilling was actually purposeful, like sorry, what its intentional purpose was for in each zone. So having this this kind of unpacking that, you know, across the say SK2, SK1, it actually really allowed people to understand um, that it wasn't overwhelming in terms of this exploration program. It was actually focused and methodical and there was different purposes for like the infill drilling um, or drilling at depth extent actually played into the overall exploration program. And again, this is very high level, but I've just pulled out a few key slides because there was further in depth, but people could look at this and, and you know, if you didn't actually understand the geology of what was going on, you could go, okay, I understand how this exploration is actually coming into play. So using these two diagrams, it actually helped really set the scene for actually what the more in depth um, exploration program was and what the actual um, real focus for the company was to increase those ounces. And we also had a really clear, um, precise next 12 months activities and milestones. This is very simplified, but it was actually just showing that the company had these clear um, objectives and they had a clear focus of what they wanted to do and how that sat together. So they had the resource growth opportunity was really critical to the company to increase that resource for the economics of it. And then also continuing their studies across it so that the company wasn't going to um, wait for the resource to be increased to a size, um, to a much more substantial size. They were actually continuing their studies along the way. So they were continuing to de-risk the project. Um, and then at the end, our why invest statement. So I touched on the investment highlights. So investment highlights, as, just to repeat again, is, is really setting the scene for the company and what they do. The why invest that sits at the end, I like to simply remind people that the way that I look at this is our, leading, our slide that we're leaving people with. And, if, and the way that I really summarise it, and, and at times some people think this is really basic, but I look at this as the last moment, last impression you're leaving with um, a potential investor or shareholder. And it's, if I give you a dollar today, what are you going to do with my money to make it $2? So the why invest should be slightly different from the investment highlights that existed at the, the front but it should be compelling enough for people to go, okay, I'm going to give you my, my money to invest in your story and bring this into futrition. So um, it, they should be different. But again, also I like to remind people that the two slides I've talked about is the investment highlights and the why invest. If I had to line up a group of presentations for a, um, a person and I had you know a half an hour to present to them and I had to give them 10 presentations, I would like to think that my clients in particular um, that we have at White Noise, that we could pull out two slides and go, 
these are the two slides we want you to read from each of our companies. And then we want you to tell us which companies you want to have a meeting with after that. We can fill in the details in between, but both the investment highlights and the wine vest should be compelling to actually hold that story together and for people to want to actually ask more about your company and what you do. So shaping the narrative. So overall, by shaping the narrative, which is what I've, I've stepped through there, you should be really trying to understand what your audience is and keeping it focused. But by, by taking control of your market narrative, you're in turn able to take care of your share price. So you're actually in control of this. And it leads into um, the end points again, really just re-highlighting, reiterating this is it comes back to the basics. So that narrative is formed based on your understanding your objectives, your audience, and your competitive landscape. These three things do not change no matter what size you are as a company and no matter what phase you are in as a company. It's really important to always recheck in back on these. The amount of times we've had new companies or clients actually sign up with us and I ask them um, in an initial strategy meeting, what's your objective? And they feel unclear about that. You, we actually generally sit back and go, okay, we need to have a different kind of um, you know, strategy session here. You need to, as a company, have a really clear objective and understanding what your future is. And once you have that, you need to constantly recheck in on that because, you know, in an ASX listed environment, as I've touched on, one drill hole can completely change the direction of your company and you can grow very, very rapidly. Or it could be more challenging. So you need to sit there and understand what your objective is and how we actually can adapt um, around that. And maybe it's looking at those M&A or those JV opportunities um, or land acquisition to actually change your company and, and what you are. Um, your audience, so checking in through that cycle. What is your audience? Making sure that we're meeting our audiences at um, a platform that they understand or a language level that they understand. So making your announcements too complicated in that early phase, it can be really negative for you because we're relying on retail audiences to jump in and be excited about your story. When they're overwhelmed with information that they don't understand, it becomes very hard for them to actually buy into that. Um, and your competitive landscape. So really looking at, again, still understanding your audience and go and, and being you know, realistic that the competitive landscape these days, because it's so easy to actively trade, is actually not just traditionally who you might think it is. When we have um, markets similar to what we've got at the moment, where it's really um, access to capital is becoming harder and harder, that competitive landscape is really much more unpredictable. People are comparing um, gold stocks across to batteries not so much because they're comparing them like to like, but what they're actually looking for in that competitive landscape is where I can have the opportunity for the DS upside. So your competitive landscape as a junior um, is very challenging at times to understand because it's, it's, yeah, it's not straightforward like it used to be, unfortunately. So that's really um, very concise understanding of, of trying to explain how we can pair back the investor story and really make it compelling for people to understand.